Good morning, Makers Church. Uh, it is so, so good to be together. I had the wonderful privilege to uh, meet several of you that are here for the first time this morning. And if I haven't yet, uh, welcome. We're so glad that you're with us. My name's Derek. I serve here as our lead pastor. And uh, we're just so glad to be together. Whether you've uh, been around for a long, long time or here for the first time or coming back to visit every, every time you're in town, we're just so glad that you're here. And before we jump into kind of a new conversation and uh, a new series, um, I have a cool update for, for all of us as a church. Um, if you're new with us, this is all news to you. But if you've been journeying with us for a while, uh, you'll know that over the last three years, um, and really more than three years, um, our team has been working diligently to come up with a plan to renovate this old building. And um, it's cold in here because nothing works. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a false hope that our furnace worked. It don't work anymore. Um, well, there's just a lot of, of love and, and care that needs to be poured back into this space. And uh, the Lord has shown us a few different ways to go about doing that. And the last and final way uh, was to sell property across the street. That has been a long, long journey. And uh, we closed escrow on Wednesday. So... Um, Really, really important milestone for us as a church. And I just want to thank our board, our elders, many of our staff team, uh, Purpose Real Estate, who guided us through this process. And really to, to the Lord for his favor and, um, and just amazing step for us. But now, as a team, we get to put a full court press on moving forward in the renovation plans as a church. And so we're just excited uh, to finally <laughs> gain some ground on that front. So thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, super cool. Um, if you're also new with us, um, last month in January, which is crazy, folks, it's 2024, and it's already February. Um, we, we started our year um, welcoming and, and con conversing and practicing some ancient Christian spiritual traditions. Um, for the first part of this year. And so we, we talked about and we practiced Sabbath last month. Um, and if you jumped in with that and practiced in any sort of way, um, my hope is that it was uh, somewhat formational or transformative for you um, and that it becomes a, a normal part of your rhythm. Just because we're shifting gears to a new practice uh, doesn't mean we did that, done that. Let's keep, keep pressing in on rest and Sabbath. But this morning we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about fasting. Um, I, if you're like me, I'm assuming that you, you like food, right? Um, but I, my question is, do, are any of you guys like foodies? Like that's your thing. Like you, you, could, you could raise your hand, okay. You're food, you love food. And what foodie means is that you actually enjoy spending a ridiculous amount of money on like quality food, right? Yeah, like that's how you'd like to spend your money. Like you have extra money, I'm going to spend it on food. Now, me personally, I love food, but I'm like a utilitarian eater. Like I just need calories, I want to eat, I don't really care. So I'm the worst guy to take to an expensive dinner. Because I'm like, it was good. Um, <laughs> my brother-in-law, Danny, he's a sommelier, and he's a like a fine wine expert. I'm the worst guy to open a nice bottle of wine with. In my mind, there's two kinds of wine, white and red, and they're both delicious. And I couldn't tell you where came from where and what season it is or what notes there are. Um, but, but whether you call yourself a foodie and you love the experience of the culinary arts. Um, in fact, um, Nathan's not here. He's probably serving in kids ministry. But where is he? Is he working? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so Nathan Nugent, who's an elder at our church with his wife, Brooke. His parents are here because I'm assuming they're watching the kids. Amazing. <laughs> so good. Well, Nathan's my, my, my counterpart at the firehouse. He's captain of one crew. I'm the captain of, on the other crew. And usually if you love to eat, like you really like that kind of food, you like to cook because it's like an experience. Nathan and me are the perfect example of opposites. Uh, in the fire department, you have to cook when you're a firefighter. So like in the back seat. And so I thought I liked to cook. And so in my household for many, many years, I was kind of the main cook because I was cooking all the time. I thought I was decent at it. I thought I enjoyed it. Then I promoted and realized I don't like to cook. <laughs> and I don't love food that much. So I'd, I'd never cook. Nathan, on the other hand, the man likes to eat. 
And he loves to cook, and so he's a way better captain in the opinion of our station because <laughs> he helps out in the kitchen and I don't. But regardless of, of how much you love to cook or eat, I'm sure that we all love a feast. And if you're like me or like most people, you're far more comfortable with feasting than you are with fasting. And yet, many of us in this room would, would agree with the idea that we are aiming to apprentice under Jesus, that we're aiming to be disciples of Jesus. And to do that is to take our whole entire life and organize it around three basic goals. To be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what he did. That, that's what it means to be an apprentice or a disciple. I mean, the fire department, uh, we have no hesitation at all to modeling for the new firefighters. This is what you should do. This is how you should act. This is how it should get done. And we are proud when they do what we do. And Jesus is the same way. As we disciple and apprentice under him, uh, we should watch what he did and do what he did and become like he was. And it's to kind of adopt our whole lifestyle, to arrange our life in the rhythms and the way of life that Jesus lived because it's the only opportunity for God to transform us from the inside out. And so if we look closely at the, at the life of Jesus through the scriptures, we, we'll see really quickly that Jesus feasted. In fact, in, in, in Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, it says this about Jesus. It says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And what you see throughout the whole life of Jesus is he was sitting at all the wrong tables, right? He was sitting with all the people he shouldn't have been sitting with. And he was inviting people to his table. And there was always food involved. In fact, so much so that after Jesus died and resurrected, and right before he was about to ascend to heaven, he gave us the bread and the cup and the table to remember him by, in which we'll, we'll participate in towards the end of our gathering. He gave us communion or the Eucharist to, to remember him by. And so we can see that Jesus absolutely feasted, and feasting is good, and oftentimes one of the best ways that we can even experience the goodness and love of God. But we also see that Jesus fasted. In fact, he began his ministry in the wilderness for 40 days fasting. And when the devil tempted him to eat, he said, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we can see in the life of Jesus that he both feasted and he fasted. And yet today, if you're like me and most Christians in the West, fasting is not a normal part of our life. Fasting is not a spiritual discipline that I have conquered or even really practiced all that much, just full transparency. So as I welcome us into this conversation this morning, this is an invitation for me as much as it is for you. I've dabbled. I definitely have not made it a normal part of my life. And if that's true of you, you're not alone. You're not alone because fasting has basically disappeared from modern Christian practice, in the, at least in the West. Uh, you're more likely to hear about fasting from fitness gurus or wellness experts or even from Muslims. They're, they're far better at it than we are. And it gets a little bit more complicated, especially when we start talking about fasting, uh, because so many in our culture, and maybe even you, have dealt with unhealthy areas and, and, and relationship to eating. And, and maybe the idea or talking about fasting itself brings about all sorts of body shame or, or your relationship with eating or food or eating disorders. And, and so we, we want to we welcome us as a church into this with all of that on the table, knowing that, that this might not be a practice that is the right time for you, but I also want to help us understand that, that there are some beautiful, beautiful benefits to this if we can approach it in a healthy way. And so we want to do this in community, and we want this to be a safe place where you can talk about 
and be honest about and journey together with folks who have maybe had unhealthy relationships with eating. There are some people who are far ahead in their, in their healing, and there are some of you that, that really need help along the way, and we'd love to help partner with you in that. And all of that being said, all, all of that being said, what, what if we're missing out on one of the most important practices of Jesus? Through fasting. We see this in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. I've said this many times. I say it again. If I had to rip three pages out of the Bible and only had them uh, accessible for the rest of my life, it would be the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's Jesus's best hits. It's, 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 the, it's the, the most beautiful, poignant, potent uh, words of Jesus that, that we can find in the scriptures. And in Matthew 6, 16 through 18, he says this about fasting. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, there's two, two things I want you to kind of take a look at in this passage that they jump right off the page to me. First, it says, when you fast. And it's, it's clear that Jesus assumed that his apprentices, that his disciples would be those that fasted. He just he didn't say, if you fast. He says, when you fast. And he also says this, that your Father in heaven sees you and he will reward you. And what he's promising, what he's saying is that there's a gift on the other side of this practice. And still, most followers of Jesus in the West don't practice fasting. But we used to. We used to. So here's just a brief history of, of kind of the church's or Christian's relationship with fasting. Um, first of all, fasting is part of every major world religion that there is. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, uh, many even um, like indigenous rich, uh, religious practices, uh, Christianity. It, it's a common spiritual practice across all religions in the world. But the first mention of it, the first mention of it we find in the Hebrew scriptures about Moses on Mount Sinai as he fasts for 40 days. And and then he, he's, it follows up in the scriptures with this commandment for all of Israel to fast on the Day of Atonement, or what many of you have heard called Yom Kippur. And, and that's kind of the first time in, in any religious text we see or hear or see modeled fasting. And there's stories all throughout the Old Testament, Moses and David and Samuel and, and Esther and the prophets, just so many stories of them participating in this practice. By the time of Jesus, it was a common practice for Jewish people to fast twice a week. Just absolutely normal part of the rhythm of life. And they would fast from sun up to sundown twice a week. For the Jewish people at the time of Jesus and still to this day, it was Mondays and Thursdays. And the early Christians continued this practice for like a millennia and a half. Like Without any, there was no questions about it. In fact, this is so interesting to me. In the Didache, which is kind of the first Christian writing that we see outside of the New Testament, uh, fasting was commanded on Wednesdays and Fridays and for two full days before baptism. Um, almost all of the church fathers taught on it. Uh, and the first Christians took it very seriously. And we see this uh, from 380 AD called the Constitutions of the Holy Apostles. It says this, If any one of the clergy be found to fast on the Lord's day or on the Sabbath day, except one only, let him be deprived. But if be one of the laity, let him be suspended. Meaning fasting was so widespread that they had to regulate it. But could you imagine that? Like, you're fasting too much on the wrong days. Don't do it. Right? Um, the only day that he's talking about is, is actually Silent Saturday. It's the day between uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And that was the one day in kind of Christian tradition that fasting was allowed on Sabbath. 
uh, to help us and our bodies and our minds kind of experience the, the full sacrifice that Jesus gave for us on the cross. So it's regulated. It's like highly regulated in the life of the church. Lent, which is the six weeks leading up to Easter. Many of you have kind of heard about it, dabbled about it. Most of you might know it by like Fat Tuesday or kind of like the, the kind of cultural, you know, response to Lent. But the actual Lent, the beginning of, of this idea was 40 days of fasting from morning till evening for 40 days except for Sundays. Sundays were considered little mini Easter's, little mini days of resurrection along the way. Um, most of us now in, in church traditions, especially around Lent, um, it's not fasting from food specifically. It is like you give something up for Lent. That's kind of like a common thing. Um, like you might give up meat or you might give up technology or something like that. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, but if we're going to compare that to like the ancient Christian practice, um, that's actually not fasting. It's, it's abstinence. And abstinence is also a, a, a very well-known, very commonly practiced uh, spiritual discipline. It's just different. It's good, and there are so many of us that could probably benefit from a digital abstinence or uh, a technology, you know, social media, what many would call fast. Um, but in the original kind of practice, it was just specifically about food. And, and so what we can see here, and just kind of by showing you the history, is, is that uh, in the history of the church, there were both regular days of fast, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, and then there were uh, longer periods of fast like Lent. Um, and they were super, super common, and that's changed. That's changed. Um, it started to die out after about a millennia and a half. Why? Uh, we, see, we see this uh, also by John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist Church. He says this. This is in the 18th century. He says, I fear that there are now thousands of Methodists, so-called, uh, both in England and Ireland, who, following the same bad example, have entirely left off fasting, who are so far from fasting twice a week that they do not fast even twice a month. Could you imagine? You know who you are. Wesley religiously fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays like all of the early Christians did, and he refused to ordain any pastor to the ministry who didn't do the same. And you think coming to church is hard. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I agree with all of that or that's the way it should be, uh, but the whole point I'm trying to make is that Christians used to fast. Like it's been a normal, common part of our faith tradition. And it was considered central, as central, to the way of following Jesus as reading your scriptures is, or as coming to church is, or as praying is. And what we still see, if you look around the globe, is that fasting is still central to many of our faith traditions outside of the West. In the East, in the, in the Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox Coptic churches, the Delhi in India, um, all over Africa, um, it's still a very, very common practice, so much so that it's even still a, a major part of the tradition in the African-American church. And, and it has, February is Black History Month. It's a time for us to celebrate, to learn, to observe uh, the history of, of not just the church in America, of the black church in America, but of, of the African-American tradition. And fasting is one of those unwavering things in many of those faith traditions that we can learn a lot from. And if you look across the tapestry of history and of the Christian experience, fasting is one of the most essential and powerful of all of the practices of Jesus. And it's arguably the most single neglected one in our modern kind of Western church. Is anybody feeling indicted yet? Because you, sh you shouldn't. Um, and if you do, then I should feel as indicted as you. I want you to listen to this from St. Basil the Great. Um, it's also on our Instagram this morning. Thank you, Shalice. Uh, if you need to revisit this quote, but it's so powerful. 
Fasting gives birth to prophets. She strengthens the powerful. Fasting makes lawgivers wise. She's a safeguard for the soul, a steadfast companion for the body, a weapon for the brave, and a discipline for champions. Fasting repels temptations, anoints for godliness. She is a companion for sobriety, the crafter of a sound mind. In wars, she fights bravely. In peace, she teaches tranquility. That's good. And so we can see throughout the chorus of the saints and the history and the people of Jesus and the tapestry of Christianity that fasting is powerful. So I just want to talk about the basics, right? Because sometimes we can talk ethereal or we can prove that it was, but should it still be? I just want to talk basics for a moment. First of all, what is fasting? And so let's start with what it's not. It's not abstinence. Once again, abstinence is a beautiful spiritual discipline, uh, one that many of us could benefit from greatly. But you'll hear people a lot. In fact, I, I'll call them out. So, so Park Hill Church, love Park Hill, love Evan. Evan's a great, great, great friend with uh, John Mark Comer, who founded Practicing the Way, who's developed all this content that we're going through. They're doing a 40-day digital fast for Lent. Uh, and I, so I texted him. I'm like, hey, dude, your boy, John Mark, says, the Christian tradition says, you can't fast from technology. Are you guys going to go toe-to-toe? Like, can we get a, or like, like, can we throw down here um, on this fight? And so, guys, it, we don't need to mince words or fight over things, but, but, but probably the more proper way to talk about, like, turning your phone off or, or doing things would be really historically to call it abstinence, right? Um, you, you also, and I'm not trying to beat anybody up, I, I promise I'm not, but like the, you may have participated in or heard about like the Daniel fast, right? Or some other like kind of trendy fast that, that people can participate in. Also kind of a mislabeling of words because the Daniel fast was, I've never done it, but was just eating vegan, fruits, vegetables, eating vegan diet. Um, that's not fasting because you're eating. Still a wonderful thing. That's actually... That's actually just called a restricted diet, right? Um, which is also great. Like there are many things that, that we could benefit greatly from, both physically and spiritually, from re- restricting our diets from, right? Um, and so I'm not, not trying to beat that up. That's a good thing. But at the, at its, to answer the question, what is fasting? At the most basic definition, it's not eating food. That's what fasting is. Uh, just to help us with, with absolute clarity. Um, in normal fast, you drink water. Oh, there are, there's some experiences in the scriptures that talk about fasting from both. Um, but, but it's about not eating food. So then the question is, how long? How long? Actually, I feel like I should confess something. Um, earlier I said, you know, you can hear more about fasting from like fitness gurus and wellness experts. And um, not going to lie, I gained a couple pounds. My, my pants got a little bit tight. And I was looking for a way to change that. And intermittent fasting is one of the most proven ways uh, to do that. And so I've been intermittent fasting for a while. And um, that is not a spiritual act. <laughs> Inle- unless you make it one, which you could. But th- that's like, that's a different, there's a different why behind it, which we're going to get to. Okay. So like, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of intermittent fasting if you want your pants to fit. Um, but this is, this is different. Right? How long? If you say, okay, I want to follow Jesus in the way that he lived, and I want to follow the history of all the church tradition, and I want to fast, uh, I know what it is. It's not eating. How long should I not eat? The most common, the most common is a not eating for, from sun up to sundown for a day. That's like the most common. And that might sound impossible for you, um, and that's okay. Uh, but that's kind of just the most common example. However, in the scriptures, there are examples and stories of two-day and three-day and seven-day, 21-day, 40-day fast, right? That sounds impossible uh, to me. But it, it doesn't, the, the question of how long, um, whatever, you, whatever you want to make it. Um, when? When do we fast? Like, wh- when is the right time to fast? 
I want you to hear this this morning. Nowhere in the scriptures, nowhere in the life of Jesus, nowhere in the, in the, in the early part of the church, church fathers, nowhere other than in the Didache and some other stuff, it's not commanded. It's not required. It has no bearing on your salvation or anything like that. It's not required. So the question of when do you fast, it's up to you. Uh, but there see two ways of, of responding to fasting. One is in rhythm, like finding a day or two days a week or whatever day that you would want to incorporate that into your life. And then another one is in response, response to something. You see that all over the scriptures. First Samuel 31, after King Saul dies, they call the entire nation to fast for seven days in Jonah 3. When Nineveh is warned of their coming destruction, the king calls for a citywide fast so that they're spared. In Esther 4, we see the Hebrew people are threatened with genocide, and Queen Esther calls for three days fast, and they're all saved, right? So it's a response and a rhythm, right? And we're going to spend the next rest of this month kind of breaking down the different whys or the different ways that that we can fast. But my point is, is that it's both rhythm and response. Do we fast in community or alone? And I know what you're thinking. Dude, you just read Matthew 6, right? Like you just read, don't be loud about it. However, um, we see all throughout the scriptures People fasting in community. I just named a couple scenarios where the whole city or the whole tribe was called to fast. Uh, what the scriptures say in Matthew six is not that you should fat not is not that you shouldn't fast in community. It says that you shouldn't fast to virtue signal. Is basically what it says. Don't fast for the purpose of saying, "Wow, look how holy I am." But you can do it in community. It's modeled over and over and over. But most importantly, we come to probably the most essential question is why should we fast? Why, why should we fast? And the, we're going to unpack these over the next four weeks. And the first and probably most important one is to offer ourselves to Jesus. Week two, we'll talk about to help us grow in holiness. Week three, we'll talk about to amplify our prayers. And week four, we'll talk about to stand with the poor. And we'll unpack all of that, and, and we'll, we'll try to make some sense out of those four reasons for us to fast. But the most important is to offer ourselves to Jesus. Yeah. And the early Christians practiced twice a week, and they, they shifted the schedule, right? Uh, J- the Jewish folks went from went on Mondays and Thursdays. The early Christians decided to shift the days. They kept the practice. They shifted the days to Wednesday and Friday. Because Wednesday is the day that Jesus was betrayed, and Friday was the day that he went to the cross. And we see that the Christians weekly remind themselves of the truth and the power and the story of what Jesus came to do. And ultimately, what they entered into is what the New Testament writers called participating in the sufferings of Christ. Right? This is, we see this all over the New Testament, that we as Christ followers, that we would participate in his suffering. And so they were intentionally adopting that pattern and a desire for Jesus. And this is the ultimate reason to help us grow in hunger for Jesus. To grow in hunger for transformation. Uh, John Piper calls fasting whole body hungering for God. Scott McKnight calls it body talk. It, it's, it's, it's a way, you know, what, when you think about what is hunger, what, what does hunger do? It, it's, it's, it's a feeling of wanting or needing something that you don't have. Yeah. Right? And, and I, I guess I'll just say this too. That sounds really noble. There, there are many times in my life where I, I actually am not hungering for Christ, just to be truly honest. Like, uh, there are times when I desperately need the nearness and closeness of Christ, and fasting would be a way to grow that hunger. There are also times where I'm just indifferent or ambivalent towards my need for Christ. And fasting is also 
a way to help grow in that hunger, maybe to unearth some latent desires within us. Fasting is a practice to offer our whole life to God. What Jesus tells us, what the scriptures tell us, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. They're also known as our bodies. And I think if we look at Romans 12, we talked about this last week a little bit when it came to Sabbath, but Romans 12 says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The Greek word for that is soma. Uh, Soma means our whole being, right? Our whole person, including our body. And in the West, specifically since the time of the Enlightenment, uh, we have become brains with legs, especially in our faith tradition. Right? We, we, we want to think about God. We want to know more about God. We want to get the right thinking or the right theology into our heads. And even if we do that, maybe the next thing is it's about the heart. Right? The heart, that's a good thing. Jesus is always talking about the heart. But for some reason in, in, in recent Western kind of Christian history, we've just kind of deleted the body from being part of the equation. And I think it's because... Um, in the kind of the Western church, we've lost what Pope John Paul II calls the theology of the body. Simply put, it's a truth that we see in all the scriptures that we don't have a body. We are a body. We've undervalued the importance of our bodies. In fact, so many times we associate with our bodies as bad or wrong or sinful or evil or we talk about the matters of the flesh. But Jesus himself came in a body. We call that the doctrine of the incarnation. Jesus himself resurrected from the dead into a body. We call that the doctrine of the resurrection. And the hope that we are waiting for as people of Jesus is not to just celebrate that he came, but that he's also coming again. And when he does, he's bringing a new heaven and a new earth, and he is resurrecting all of us into our bodies that we too will be raised from death to life. And so in the meantime, what would it look like if we took seriously our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you? Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So your body is a temple. It's a dwelling place. And therefore, what we do with God, it matters. It's, It's the sphere where our discipleship unto Jesus gets real. Where it's not just an idea or a feeling, but We're called our entire being into the way of Jesus. One way to think about apprenticeship or discipleship is it's a disciplined attempt to get the teachings of Jesus into our bodies, into our self, into our neurobiology, into our muscle memory. So that when confronted with various situations or challenges or circumstances, that what might come out of us is what we've put into us. And fasting is perhaps one of the best ways to get the teachings of Jesus into our bodies. Romans 12 says that we do this in view of God's mercy. Meaning we do this because of all that he's done for us. We fast for all sorts of reasons. We'll discover those in the next few weeks. But the primary reason we fast is not to get something from Jesus, but it's to give something to Jesus. It's what the scriptures call worship, affection, devotion. So I'll end with this. Jesus assumed that his disciples would fast. It's never commanded by him 
by any of the church fathers. They all did fast, but they never laid down a regimen to follow or some religious ritual for us to be obedient to. You don't have to fast. It's not required. But Jesus fasted. And he said, come and follow me. And all of these practices like Sabbath and prayer and fasting, they're, they're how we follow Jesus. How we open our whole person to his grace and his transformation. So I just wonder for us in true curiosity, what would happen if or when we chose to practice this discipline not to give ourselves to the practice, but to give ourselves to Jesus through the practice. What would shift? What would be formed and transformed inside of us? My hope, my belief, my trust is that we would fully experience the reward on the other side, which is Jesus himself. Would you pray with me? God, we, I'm sure all of us are a bit squirmish in our seats. Maybe curious or provoked. Maybe even guarded. And Lord, I know in, inside of our souls, there's maybe all sorts of like, what I would call yellow flags, maybe even red flags popping up. Like, oh, this seems performative or this seems transactional or this seems um, all of, all of the, the ways we can reason ourselves out of it. But God, you called us to experience the fullness of life. And Lord, you modeled for us what that life looks like. And so God, my prayer is that through all of these practices, that we would grow in our yearning and in our longing to be with you, to become like you, and to do what you did. And God, that as you form and transform us, God, that our lives and the lives around us and the world that we live in would be made different because of the powerful transformational work that only you can do. God, fasting won't heal us, won't save us, won't make us better, but you can and you long to. And Lord, what if our fasting brought us closer to you? I pray that you would inspire each and every one of us to what degree we would lean in and engage. And would you push us one step further? In your name we pray. Amen. So I'll end with this, just like clear, clear invitation. Transformation, it takes more than knowledge. It takes more than knowledge. It takes practice. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to journey through those, those topics that we talked about. To give ourselves to Jesus, to grow in holiness, uh, to amplify our prayers, to stand with the poor. Every week, the invitation is going to be the same in terms of practice. Um, and it's to not eat <laughs> for some period of time. For you, it might be one meal. For you, it might be a snack. Um, I am known as the snack guy on our dirt bike riding crew, so it would be not eating snacks. Where's Doug? He's not even here to yell. There he is. I love snacks. Maybe it's a snack. Maybe it's a meal. Maybe it's two meals. Um, to give that up. And in place of that eating, um, to allow those hunger pangs and those, uh, just your own awareness of your own body to drive you closer to Jesus. Now, there's a lot more practical ways to invite you into this. Um, and we would love for you to jump into our digital community that resources you with a guide and some videos. And uh, there are physical communities that are gathering that you can journey together with through this. So the simplest way to get involved in any of that is to text the word MAKERS to 97000. If you respond with the number one, it will opt you into uh, the, getting our into our digital group where you can get the companion guide and the videos and all of the content. 
Um, and then if you join a community, uh, I don't know what that number is, but you'll see it. Um, any community at our church that says PTW in the front is a community that's committed weekly to going through this together, practicing together, and talking about the way that's going. So we would love for you to come on the journey with us and uh, pray that you'd be transformed through it. Would you stand and uh, sing with us? You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more